Hey guys, this is Eric Weingarten with Weingarten Racing, and today's video is Friday, and usually that does something over racing, and but uh, not a lot of racing going on. One, because it's hot, really hot. Um, other two, the second thing is there's parts. But um, I told you, if you watched any of the previous videos, I said if you guys had any questions, today I would try to answer those questions. I've got some things set up that are, I think, pretty neat. And I'll go ahead and pre-warn you because it's the beginning of the video. This video might be extremely long, it might be extremely short, I don't know, I'm just gonna go right at it. But if it's too long, um, here's what I can recommend. You can always press pause and come back to it later or just not watch it all the way. Um, that's up to you. The reason why I mention that is because sometimes I'll have videos and I'll have people say, uh, I wish you would explain more. So then I explain more and then I'll have a comment, the video's too long. Okay, well, here's one thing I can't do. Whenever you guys watch a video, I can't make it longer after it's already edited, uh, put out there, but you can make it shorter by simply stopping the video. So I'll give you the choice to not read it, um, watch as much as up to you. However, I really think this one's gonna be a pretty good one because I've got a lot of things set up and try to explain some things. I asked you guys for questions and I'll get to those in just a minute. Um, before I do, I actually wanted to give an update for some of the other stuff that's happened because uh, a lot of people have watched my video about nothing but problems. And I do have a small update for that. And I'll tell you some new problems that came up that kind of irritate me too. One, the head was sent back off. The first one you saw, it was up on the mill that had been welded. I sent it back to its manufacturer. They got it last week. I finally got a response today on it. So about two weeks or so. And they, they said that they're working on another head and they're in process of making it and getting it back to me. Do I know if they're gonna cover my shipping or anything else? They've said no, no indication either way on that. So as of now, a new head is being made. It should be perfect to match the one that I have. All right, but let's get to the questions. First one that someone asked was, um, he, he said, can you um, deal with the myth about you, high compression ratio needs big cams or a big cam needs high compression? That, I think this is more based on like old school thinking because if you went back in the past, cams weren't as highly developed as what they are now. And typically what you would see is like most race cams had a lot of duration. And I'll go ahead and tell you, and I could do a video on this. The worst thing you can do for a camshaft is give it too much duration. And in this last week, three people have called or asked about uh, something and listening to their cam specs, their duration is far too much. And you're like, what's that got to do with anything? When you have too much duration, that means the valves have stayed open longer. What happens is there's not enough time for that, uh, for the valve to close and for the cylinder to actually build pressure. And if it doesn't build pressure, it won't uh, get as much torque and you get the idea. So if you go back to what the old people used to think was you, for those cams, you had to have higher compression ratio. And the reason being is because they had so much duration, they didn't have as much torque, especially down low. So to help that, you raise the compression ratio because that builds torque. Um, and then that kind of makes up for the fact that you've lost so much torque because you've got too much duration and it's made up with compression. Now, modern times, whenever I think about designing a cam, not really designing a cam, I should say specking a cam for a customer, I think of, well, what compression ratio do they have? I try to target a dynamic one that, um, that will work. And so I look at the duration that they have, the lobe separation, those um, opening closing points to figure out where I want the vents to be and also try to target a, a dynamic compression ratio, or should, I probably say that wrong, static, one of the two. I, I probably said it wrong because I'm talking too fast. But anyway, I target a certain number and usually the good number in case you're wondering is if you screwed in a compression ratio tester, if you got around between 220 and 240, you're, you're right there in the ballpark. Now, by the way, that's generalities. But if it's below that, usually you've got a turd, so you've got to do something different. But anyway, with modern designs, we can now um, have more lift without having to have more duration on the cam. So before, like let's say you wanted a 630 lift cam, you might have a cam that had 279 degrees of duration at 50 thousandths. So, and if you had something that might be normal, say for a 350, like maybe 250 degrees of duration, that might only give you like 580 lift. Well, cam load profiles advance so much that you can have, now you can even go down to like 236 degrees of duration or 232 degrees of duration at 50 thousandths and have like 640 or 650 lift. 
which you couldn't, and which I shouldn't say couldn't, really weren't as available in the past. So, point being is the new cam lobes designed, and I'm not even like this year, we're talking like, like easy the last 15 years. Um, they have less duration, more lift, so you're able to not have to have as much um, compression ratio to get it up. Although, really the biggest thing you could do to kill an engine, too much duration on your camshaft. Um, you'd be surprised about how many people have the wrong camshaft and it's too much duration. It's not, it has nothing to do with lift. You can even say, it, can you kill it if you have too little lift? Yeah, but still the biggest killer, too much duration. Anyway, that's question one. Hopefully that one is out of the way. Let's go to question number two that they, someone brought up was, do, I, um, do you do anything differently when you port uh, four valve relief heads versus two valve relief heads? I'll go ahead and tell you, and this one's a quick one. I'm not the guy to answer on that because I don't do um, domestic, or sorry, foreign heads. And I also don't do domestic heads that have, or for like four cylinder and stuff. So I know the mod motors have four valve reliefs, but none has ever come in. I actually used to have the flow fixture to flow them, but I, I just don't even mess with it. I just turn it away. So I'm not the guy to answer with it, but if I was to speculate on a two valve head, typically we go bigger on the bowl um, because, well, it gets a better Venturi effect, but if you went really big on a bowl, on a, this is speculation, on a four valve head, you, you'd probably create a dog because you've got so much more valve curtain area than a two valve relief head that you really probably can't do the same thing. The other thing I think is gonna be a bit more tricky on the four valve head is because your diameter is smaller on the valve itself, it's harder to get the seat angles and profiles that would work well. It's much easier when the valve's bigger because it gives me more, I can put longer, my undercuts can be longer than what you could do with a um, smaller head valve because usually the ports are short and the seat's short, so you can't, you can't do it. And I know this because I ported a motorcycle head, it was two valve though, and there's no way I could have used any of my custom cutters that I did on, on any of the V8 stuff because those angles would have came in, but it wouldn't have worked at all for that port. So I, the trickier point I think would be the valve job itself and the actual angles that they have. I think that's more critical on the four valve heads. Also, they don't, just don't have as much lift. So you look at us two valve heads, we can have anywhere between, I mean, the small ones are 480 lift. So there's some circle track stuff all the way up to like my big blocks 937 and some are over one inch. Uh, you won't see that typically in the four valve heads. They're usually like fours, maybe fives. They're definitely not in the sixes. There's, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. So in that case, they target a different area of the flow curve than what would be happening with our two valve heads. So point being is, uh, I can't answer your question on that to give you an idea. Next one was asked is, what do you do different on a, uh, do you port a dual plane manifold? Yes and no. As far as like getting after it is, um, it's, not, it's not the same. So on a single plane manifold, it's really easy to, well, I shouldn't say easy, but you port, um, the runners itself and it's you you trying to taper you calculate your taper that you'll have your opening area and those sort of things on a dual plane at least when i port them um i don't do as much usually it's cutting out the divider some because i want to make the plenum feel like it's bigger for the engine so the rpm is better and i try to make the taper from the plenum into the runners bigger or better because you really can't you can't alter their um opening area of their runners because the way they're in the port it's too hard to get to and also even if you did when i look down into them usually they're pretty thin so it's not like i can make that opening area bigger like i'd like it to be so you're pretty much almost stuck with the design that's there um however i would say if you're running a dual plane you're probably you're more should be targeting more of your street manners once you get into racing and people are gonna, I don't care if you comment this, cause I didn't believe it till I saw it either. I've seen it several times. If you're running a dual plane, they're awesome on the street, better gas mileage, they're, they're, you feel better on the street. I promise you on the drag strip, the single plane's faster. And you're like, ah, oh, this guy knows nothing. I had a customer and I did, this is back when I ported cast iron heads. I do not port cast iron heads. I have no idea why circle track classes still have cast iron head rules. They cost more. This is ridiculous. But anyway, I had a customer who brought me a set of Vortec heads to port. I ported them. By the way, someone had asked too, uh, what's a good flow for Vortec heads? 
It varies. I've seen someone, there's a local headquarter who actually got them over 300 CFM. The highest I've ever gotten was 285. And the reason why I didn't push it further is because you could feel behind the short side and there wasn't enough material there. Like it felt thin. And then one of the next one I did, did the same areas, measured everything and broke through. So typically it was between 270 and 283 is where I targeted just because I knew it was safe. However, so you think of Vortec head in an S10 like this, the customer runs the truck and it runs fast. And he assures me that the single plane is faster than dual plane. I'm like, that makes no sense. I know when the um, Vortec heads are gonna sign off and that dual plane should make more power in the range that that Vortec head is in. He tried both and the single plane was better at the track. Now on the street, it probably felt different, but the track was better. So then I had another 350 to put in um, the Malibu I don't have anymore, but uh, I tried it and it's, it was correct. Every time a single plane's been added, it's faster on the track. Now, this could be because usually we're running um, shifting or most of our RPMs are above 6,000. I assume if you're below 6,000, maybe that changes it. But every time, and Vortec head is not that high RPM deal, every time the single plane's gone faster. So point being is if you've got a dual plane and you're thinking, man, how do I port this? If you're going to race it, you'd be better off with a single plane. Otherwise, just do the basic modifications, cut down that divider some, blend in the plenum itself, and run it. Um, if you wanna to go to the racetrack, single plane will be faster. It'll feel like a dog on the street though, because below RPMs, it's just not as good. Someone else asked also, what plenum mods do you do in a single plane? Do you focus on the plenum on the single plane? Yes, that's actually where I do. Um, because I'm trying to, when I pour a single plane manifold, you've watched some of my other videos, you know this, but I target line of sight, the area of um, the ports, or the area of opening, and those are some of the key main things. Well, that's in the plenum, okay? So that's, that plays an important part. So most of the work actually is done in the plenums. Someone else asked, it'd be cool if you float ahead and then put an intake on and float it before and after. There is a video already done that. I've done that for my, um, a customer, and it's already on my, uh, I think it's, I'm 99% sure, Look up the Tunnel Ram one. It was a Holley, it's for a small block Chevy, but it was a Holley Strip Dominator, or Street, yeah, Strip Dominator, Pro Dominator, that's what it was. And I uh, ported the heads, floated with an unported intake, then ported the intake and floated again. So I've done it that way. I will say, and people keep asking me to flow intakes, and I used to flow them all the time for solid two years. It will lead you wrong. And you're like, what do you mean? If you add a lot of curve, a lot of radius on your runner dividers, it will it will flow way more air than if the runner dividers get narrow. You're like, oh, you mean like razor blade? No, no, I'm not talking like make them like a knife edge. I'm saying you got a big fat radius the size of my finger, okay, and then I uh, thin it down to say that big. So around this, people are still like that's too thin. No. Because on the flow bench, the one that's the size of my finger flows more air. And you're like, well, it should make more power. Wrong. Because if I've got something like this, where there are two big radiuses, this is the size of the inlet compared to something that looks something like that. Now I've got more area. The more area helps it make the power upstairs. It's not, the flow bench is a tool. And that's one of those things where it was like, led you wrong. Um, I know this because I spent two years doing it and saw it happen. So when the area got bigger and it had a better line of sight, it made more power than having better flow with a higher radius. Um, but anyway, I'll probably do a video later on about that one. Okay, that takes care of that. But I'm gonna go to something. Now let's get to some tricky stuff. I actually set up some things. Um, <clears throat> someone had asked, TPV actually, uh, could you do an explanation or tell me which is better, the splayed valves or SB2? Um, I'm probably going to mess up the, the actual names of stuff, but I want to talk about port layout, how they are for different cylinder heads. So you, and then I'm going to talk about some things of why certain ones have the design to make more power. Doesn't mean they can make more power, but the architecture is there to help them make better power. So bear with me as I show you this, because I've got a couple cool things I want to show you anyway. Uh, by the way, thanks for sticking around. I'm gonna edit this next part in because I have to go to the phone. Okay guys, I didn't realize the video was getting so long. Um, 
Um, what I'm probably gonna do is have this one be gigantic, but I understand if you don't wanna watch all the way through, I don't know that I even would watch a 40 minute video. I'd probably skip it to a different video. But I will say I'm probably gonna chop these up and make them into vid videos later on for different days, just smaller. This way everybody gets a chance to at least see it. So if you see another video that looks like this one, it's just part of this one in that. I probably should have done that anyway, but I told you guys to answer the question. I don't wanna feel like let you down. But anyway, to the question, let's talk about port layout before I talk about the SB2 thing. I have three different heads here and actually one on the other side and I'll show you. This is a small block Chevy Headhunter. This is a small block Ford. And this is an LS7. And this is a big block Chevy head. Okay. We're going to talk about port layout real quick because that plays an important part of this. Um, these heads here, these three are called inline heads. Because if you look at the valves, that's where the valves would stick through. They are all in line. If you compare that to the big block Chevy, these look like they're in line, but not the exhaust. And the other thing is, which you can't really see from the camera, is the valve doesn't go straight down or even at an angle like this. It's also kicked this way. So besides being at not straight up and down, it's, they're always like an angle. It's also moved over like this, called the cane or cam. Um, that's a big block Chevy head. These don't have it that way. So it's a bigger difference in the layout. Now let's get to these two and talk about them. The small block Chevy, these two ports look like they're different, but they're the same and different. So let me explain. The cylinder for a small block Chevy would be right here. So that you can picture this being the circle, that's where the cylinder is. The air enters here, and as the valve opens, it's hitting the cylinder and going that way. This one will go the other way. But essentially, this port is identical to this one, it's just mirrored. In other words, if you take it and you flip it, you would have that port. Now, for a small block Ford and the LS, their ports are all identical. So this port goes, is the same as this one, this one, and this one. Same with the LS, same, same, same. That's why it's a much easier to port a Ford head, an LS head versus a small block Chevy head. Because whatever I have to do here, I have to think in reverse to do here. This one, as long as I did the same here, 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 you get the idea, it's all the same. Big block Chevys, Woo! You're in a different world. This is called the long runner, and this one's called the short runner. The cylinder for these are right here. The long runner, the air enters here and goes around here. The short runner, the air goes towards the cylinder wall and then goes back around here. So this one's more towards the cylinder center. This one's more towards the wall. This port is a lot like the small block Chevy port because think about how it goes in and here. It's like this port in and around. This short one, it's almost like a Ford port. It goes towards the wall and back around because look at the Ford here. The Ford port goes this way and back around. Like so, I don't get it. Well, I'm showing you this because a lot of Ford guys say the LS copied you. Well, I mean, I guess you could say that they're all the ports are different. I mean, all the same, I should say. And so is the LS, but they didn't copy you because check this out. Your intake port here goes to that valve. Okay. This is the LS7. This intake goes there. The Ford one has it going there. Not the same. Now I should point out the LT4 heads, theirs are reversed, at least for the one I've seen. I still haven't had it come to the shop, but I have seen some in different articles and stuff. They flipped it. So now instead of having the intake go to that point, it goes to that point. And this now becomes the exhaust. That would be the same alignment as the Ford. But besides having individual runners, they're all identical, unlike the Chevy, small block or big block, it's not the same as the Ford. Um, but anyway, these are all in line. And the question came up was which one's better, the SB2, splayed valves and stuff. Well, I want to show you something, but I don't want to do it here. So I'm going to pause it so I could set up something to kind of give you an idea about something called cross flow. And I'm probably going to do a whole nother video about this later on, but because I, I, I'm super excited to show you this. Okay, this may take a minute to explain. Um, 
I'm just using that as a loose term, but um, to explain this, but I'll do my best and bear with me as I try to explain this because this is a more complex term. So you, this here's what we have. We have our valve set up in like an inline head. Now these could be reversed, intake or exhaust, doesn't matter. But anyway, the when cross flow happens is during the overlap period of the cam. And that's actually the most important point in an NA engine because what happens during overlap, you have the exhaust valves open and the intake valve are open at the same time. And the reason why this is important is because the first draw or pull on the intake port itself comes from the exhaust gases leaving um, the cylinder. That creates a pull or a vacuum that starts pulling from the cylinder that eventually pulls from the intake because they're both open at the same time. Now, um, getting that right is the responsibility of the cam, but there are things that cylinder heads can do that kind of help it. And one of those things we call, I call, and I think others would call it too, is cross flow. And that's um, the air that goes around and towards the exhaust valve. Um, there's a certain amount of cross flow that we need. The more um, helps out to an extent, and we'll get to that in a minute. So if you look at a, um, an inline head like this case, what would happen is when the exhaust valves opened um, and it starts to pull or it starts letting out the exhaust and it's about the end of its cycle and it starts to create a um, vacuum or draw inside the cylinder, the intake valve comes open. Now, the air itself, if you think about it, my port's gonna be pointing this way because you can look right here, it's between the two. The air is gonna go this way, it's gonna hit the cylinder before it can get here. In other words, this exhaust valve has to act on all this area before it can actually get to this. I know you think, well, what doesn't it act here? It does, but if you think about the airflow itself, you're going 90 degrees in and that way. So it's much harder for it to get the cross flow um, during the overlap period. And before someone says, well, what, dude, you don't want all the air coming in and going out the exhaust valve, that's, that's ridiculous. Well, that's the duty of the cam timing itself to get those points right where it's not taking so much in that it's going out the exhaust port. We want it to start trapping in there. But this is a typical inline head. Now, this seems great, but if you notice, our chambers usually come up and come down just to aim it at this so it can draw more there. Now, if you look at the SB2 head and splayed heads, they're aiming in the big block head itself. The valve arrangement is different. It's not in line like this. So what they do is they move the intake something like that and they move the exhaust something like this. Now, this helps out cross flow. And what I'm talking about is now, if you look at it, so our intake port's here between these two bolt holes. Now, it's not going to go 90 degrees to get the exhaust valve. It's going right there, which if you think about it, my cylinder's actually spinning that way. Now, big blocks, by the way, are something like this. SB2s might be a little bit more, and then you start getting to the really cool stuff that's something like this. And we'll get to Hemi's in a minute because someone's about to mention, I'm sure. But anyway, the reason why these make more power is because not only is the valve arrangement, you got your intake port coming here, leading right towards that. You also have, most of those heads have a cane where the valve's not just tilted this way, because most heads are tilted this way anyway, but they also have a tilt this way. So it's opening, the valve's opening away from the bore the whole time, not just this way, but also this way, getting out of the way of this bore line, getting more flow, you get the idea. The exhaust valve's doing a similar thing in the same point, and it helps the flow across. So in other words, more air is getting in during the overlap before the piston starts coming in to draw more. If more air gets in, more power. That's typically why the design of a head that's something like this gives you a better chance to make more power. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to make more power, but the design is there to help it make more power. Now, someone's about to say, well, what about a Hemi? Because if you look at a Hemi, the bolts would be here and here to take out this middle one, or maybe there is one, depending on how they do it. Um, the air comes in and guess what? It goes straight out, straight to the exhaust, which seems like it'd be great, except for NA, it's, it's too much. And it's, what ends up happening is it's got such an easy draw, it actually literally does pull the intake air charge out the exhaust and becomes kind of an issue. Um, but it's beneficial for power adder. Because if you think about it, I'm pulling more air in and out. So I, I built already a bunch of cylinder pressure. It's easier for that exhaust to get out and this to bring more in. Hemis typically make more power in, um, boosted or uh, power adder deals because it's their cross flow is too much for NA. Perfect for um, the power adder deal because it's easy to get the stuff out. 
it's much easier. So anyway, uh, in A, it's, it takes too much of it away unless if it's in here than out there. Because if you think about it, they're not, by the way, hemis are not straight up and down. You have a valve that's literally like this. And the intake valve is literally, or exhaust valve is literally like this. It's just whoop, you get the idea. So anyway, back to the SB2 thing. SB2 should make more power because it's got more that it could trap during overlap period. But beyond that, you've also got some other things that should make it better in a wedge head, some wedge heads, is the ports are higher. It's got a smaller angle um, valve, um, degree of valve. It should make more power. Now, saying that, in my shop, I have seen two, and they've flowed 400 CFM, but I've seen wedge heads, like my uh, 13 degrees, flow 422, so they've flowed more than even those. But that's kind of where the flow bench might lead you astray because forgetting the flow, it, this the SB2 still would trap more air during the overlap period than a wedge head would, even though they flowed the same on the bench. Um, and that gives it more, you could have two that flow the same and that one would make more power because of it. So that's something. But I want to show you something cool I was really hoping to put together and didn't quite because i want to show you this this to me is neat and it's a project i've been trying to get it accomplished maybe you guys can help if you know a cnc machinist because it'd be great this next part's kind of weird but it relates to this all right let me take you over here let me show you what this is this is a piston in a hole and you're like big deal this is a cylinder sleeve and this i'm gonna show you how our flow benches work we have a cylinder this is from brzezinski some people have these clear acrylic ones. I don't know how they exactly, unless you're a genius or got it exactly figured out, but they, the Brzezinski is all CNC worked and it locates the cylinders directly where they would be, um, where the head would sit directly as it should on the engine block so that you're able to simulate the actual where the head would be in relation to the cylinder for the head. But anyway, Brzezinski has this thing called the slider. That's this top plate. And then it's got this bore and they make different bore sizes. And this right here is the flow stand. By the way, this thing costs a fortune. Anyway, this is a bore sleeve, okay? And what I did was I put a piston in it and I put a stop underneath it so I could set the height of the piston. And what I plan to do, and this hasn't gotten accomplished yet, was this whole setup right here would be on the stand, the stand, and I'd have it just sitting like right here. All right, and then I would have a slider that sits on top of that, like it should be, just like it's sitting now. So you get a picture of this with a piston inside, head on top, and I'd have the valves actuated. And then what I was gonna do was on the head itself, the exhaust port, I was gonna have a hose that went to here, this flow bench. And then on the intake port, I was gonna have a hose that went to this bench. And so you have the head sitting up here with the valves here, and one going to one bench, one going to the other bench. I'm like, why would you do that? I was gonna do simulate overlap flow. Because if you notice, this is a dome piston. And the dome piston, um, I was gonna try to get it at the height that it would be um, when the valves open and kind of see what happens during overlap as far as flow. Because one major disadvantage to a flow bench, of many, is when I look, you see a piston in there? No, but you know what every engine has? A piston. So as I'm measuring flow, because this is the only way you could do it, is the flow is drawing directly down. So, but if you look during overlap flow, which I just described, the air is actually being pulled from the exhaust port. So if I was able to create a suction, I could actually open the two valves and see the air going around for like cross flow. I'd be able to actually measure that. And I would see from this bench, how much intake air is going. On that one, how much exhaust air was moving. And I could see how that was actually happening during overlap. And here's something beneficial even more. You could see if the piston itself affected flow, because I don't know of any other way right now to see how the piston affects flow. We just assume it does. So like um, here we have a nice piston. It gets a dome, obviously, and it takes up the chamber. Well, what if this design changed everything you did on the port? Um, what if it made things flow so much worse? So there's, I wanted to see an exact actual, actual representation of how it'd be, um, or at least as close as I could be. Because in all fairness, the two valves are only open during overlap when the piston's pretty close to the top, which also would be when the dome would affect it the most. Because as the intake valves open more, guess what? The piston's further down on the bore. It probably plays a less important part of what's going on as far as flow-wise goes, but it would reveal all this. 
Uh, at least that's what I was hoping. Then I could, maybe I could do wet flow and I could see how the domes were affecting everything and see what's going on, or even if these valve notches played a part. There was a bunch of different things to test. I guess if the engine master's challenge was still going on, I probably would have tested this, but as it is, it was just something for fun. Because then I could set the piston at different heights, try different pistons, maybe even model my own piston. Uh, you know, just get the notches, blend them how I maybe wanted, design a dome that would to make the right compression ratio. You could grind till you figured out this is the best flowing dome I've got. Instead of like it is, where most of them just like, here's our chamber, we digitize it, it's gonna go be, it looks like it's gonna fill up the whole chamber, there's your spark plug, and then bada bam. But you would have a better idea is what I'm trying to say. And I don't think I'm the only one that's ever thought of this. I know some other people probably have. Anytime you have a great idea, I promise you five other people have already thought of it. Anyway, um, what I needed to make this happen, which hasn't yet, I needed to make a plate that would attach to this bench and then another plate that would attach to the exhaust port. So you can almost think like a header tube coming out, a flexible hose that wouldn't affect flow, so big enough where it won't make a difference. And then the bolt to here. And then I needed one from the intake port to go to this bench. So some adapter to the end of the intake port that comes out and goes to this bench and then measure it. Because during this overlap time, remember the valves are only open maybe one or two hundred thousandths. So we're talking like a max flow of maybe 250 CFM on the intake and maybe 130 on the exhaust. So not a ton, so that should have been easy to accomplish. But of course, I don't have the stuff to make the CNC things to make that happen, but I sure wanted to test it. Anyway, that's something I just want to show with you guys because it could give away, um, it, it could tell me how I could have changed my ports maybe to help with cross flow. They wouldn't help it capture more during the overlap and kind of change things. It also give me more information to give to a cam designer. Be like, hey man, you know, you know, I do, I remember I don't design cams, but I sure do spec them. But it'd be easier to be like, I know exactly now how much of this thing moves. I could change things around with my open and closing points. I can adjust it. I know what it's going to do here. Got it. Anyway, just more information. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. This is a long video. I'm probably going to splice it up and use it in different ones again. And I hope I gave you something to chew on. And I hope you didn't lose you in the first four minutes or whatever. And I rant, talked about the uh, problems I have in the shop. But uh, hopefully I give you something good. I promise I answer your questions. And I hope I did. You guys take care.